Um, my name is Ahmed Al Rashid. Um, I'm originally from Aleppo, Syria. I was born there. I lived my entire life there. That place today got so famous for all the wrong reasons. Um, prior to the conflict, I was um, an English student. I was studying um, English language and literature at the University of Aleppo. Um, it was normal, uh, quite peaceful. I go to the university, I've got friends, we go to the cinema, we go to the theater. In 2011, the Arab Spring started. Um, we never expected that it will reach Syria, but it did. And uh, um, it started as a peaceful revolution, as a peaceful uprising for people asking for, you know, political, economic reforms. Um, sadly, things went wrong. And that peaceful uprising turned into one of the most bloodiest you know, conflicts since World War II. According to the recent figures in Syria, there are over 7 million people are internally displaced. There's been multiple displacements. There are over 5 million people are taking refuge in the neighboring countries. There are over half a million people you know, um, lost their lives. Over one million person, you know, over one million people got injured in that conflict. Over three million children today are out of school in that country. This all happened in the last five years. Um, I was living in my little town, um, southeast, you know, of Aleppo, um, when some, when the shilling started, the bombing started, my town was besieged by both conflict parties at that stage. Uh, the government and the radical groups, the, the radical group elements, it was at that time ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, um, Al-Qaeda branch in Syria. Um, they, they managed to, to besiege the town after like for two, three weeks. Um, there were young people trying to defend their families. Um, there were students, you know, other young people. They, they've never had, they, they've never carried a weapon, but they, they found themselves there. They didn't have an option but to fight, defend their families and loved ones. After like two weeks, most of these people, you know, they ran out of ammunition. And eventually these radical groups um, broke into the town and they took control of it. And what they did, they captured all these people who, who, who uh, defended them, um, who resisted. They brought them to the main square of the town. They brought their families, um, their women, the, the, the mothers, the brothers, and the children to the main square as well. And what they did there, they beheaded them. I'm sorry for this, but imagine if you're a mother, if you're a sister, if you're a little brother, if you're a little boy watching your brother or your loved one just being beheaded in front of your eyes, you know. And they put their main heads at the main entrance of the town. And they said, the, the message is clear. If you resist, this will be your future. I was hiding in the town. My friends told me, please go out. You are wanted. Because I was criticizing them on the social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, I fled the town to, south, uh, to northern Iraq, to the KRG, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. I thought it would be one, two weeks till the situation um, gets better. So can, I can go back to my family, uh, my friends, my everyone there. Um, today, almost um, three years and a half since I left my town. And I never... I got the chance to go back. I, I joined, I, I moved to South, I mean, Northern Iraq. I joined the United Nations there. I worked for, for UNICEF and UNICEF there. Um, what was happening after people, you know, managed to, to, to survive the bombing and the shelling and, and all these horrendous things, people managed to get to the border. And these people, most of the time, they were bused, put in a buses, and they were driven to, most of the time, in a, in, in, in a, like a no-man land, you know, in, in a desert or somewhere where they were dumped there, they were surrounded by, the, by fences and by the army. And like an average Syrian family at that stage were like four, five, six people, you know, living in a small tent when there's no privacy for any of these people, you know. And lack of services at that stage, there was nothing. You know, there's no privacy for the children, there's no privacy for the father, for the mother, you know. And if you're a Syrian refugee living in Turkey, you do not speak the language, you know. And at the beginning, the, the people, they were very welcoming. But over time, the competition started, you know, um, it was horrendous. It was a very difficult situation. Um, I remember in, in June, it was July 2014, I was near Mosul, when the city suddenly, within like seven hours, fell to the Islamic State. At that stage, there were hundreds and thousands of people, mass displacement from Mosul, you know. And according to ISIS mentality, you know, at that stage, um, if you're the people of the book, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Christian, if you're a Jewish, you know, um, you can stay. 
but you need to pay the jizya, the, the tax that you need to pay to live on a Muslim land. This is the interpretation of Islam. But if you're not the people of the book, if you're a Yazidi, if you're a Zoroastrian or whatever, you're in a big trouble. What happened at that stage? A lot of Yazidis, the Iraqi Yazidis, took refuge on the top of Mount Sinjar in the mid-June, you know, um, 2014. Mid of the summer, scorched, about 50, 51 degrees, you know, um, no food, no water. Thousands of these people surrounded the two of them at St. John. Um, there was young people descending to fetch water for the elderly and the children. And ISIS captured these people. They beheaded them. And they destroyed their bodies into this water waste so no one can get water. And after like one week, one week you know, I remember like there were women giving birth to children. There was no, no doctors. There was nothing at all. I remember like there were women giving birth to children. These children were born lifeless. We didn't have a place to bury them. Just literally had to go just throw them away. You know, after like five days, the army started to arrive. They started dropping food and water for these people. And I remember in one, in one particular incident, the, the, the parachute was, you know, drowning, and, and, and it fell on a group of people because these people were so desperate for help. And they were running towards this parachute, and it fell on a group of people. The, the woman was pregnant. She immediately lost her life. The child, the infant, he, he, who got killed, there was a small child. He got his hand amputated. And for me, witnessing this and listening and hearing about this was just unbelievable. I fled one hell in Syria, and I ended up in another hell in Iraq. I moved southeast from, 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 from northern Iraq to Turkey. It was already one year and a half away from my family, you know. And, and that's why I decided just to get out of the Middle East at that stage, because just the, the entire region was on fire. Um, this all, all started, and my journey um, began to... to to my destination, to the UK, um, I was, um, um, I, I went to Izmir in Turkey, I met a smuggler, he said, okay, I'll get you um, um, on a yacht, and he agreed, he showed me the pictures, he said, this will be your yacht, you know, the yacht, the, this, these are the pictures, this is the kitchen, this is the bathroom, and this is the view, I, I looked at the pictures, and the views were just amazing, you know, I gave him the money, and we agreed that within 24 hours, we will be setting off. And when we got to the, 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 the beach, you know, we were at the point we are going to set off, we agreed there will be 24 people. And it turned out it's not a yacht. It's one of these, um, the video is going to be played now. <laughs> Oh my god. You know, this is like um, the, the five-star yacht that we were promised. And by the way, this picture was taken by a friend of mine, Hassan Akkad, who, who took part of the, the, the BBC documentary, Exodus, Our Journey to Europe, which I really recommend that you watch it. It's not an easy watch. Um, we were so lucky that after like three, three hours, we managed to get to Kos Island in Greece. After that, we were given like a piece of paper which allows us to take a ferry to mainland in Athens. There I had to find another smuggler. Um, I went to social media with these people that were so famous on social media, these smugglers, you know. I contacted one of them. I said, um, I told them, I want to travel. I said, you idiot, you do not, it doesn't work like this. You need to book an appointment to come and meet me. I said, I apologize. I didn't know that. So after two days, my turn came. I walked to his place. You know, it was like a huge bar. And in the backyard, there was a small office. There were dozens of people queuing to meet him. When my turn came, I walked into that place, you know. And the first thing, and he came with a suitcase full of passports. And the first question he asked me, do you speak any um, Spanish? I said, no. He said, do you speak any French? I said, no. He said, what the hell do you speak? What well, I speak Arabic, I speak Kurdish, I speak a little bit English, and I speak some Farsi. He said, okay, English would work. And he showed me one of these passports. You know, it was a Bulgarian passport. 
I told me, this could be possible. You do what I'm going to tell you. That guy was super intelligent. He drew the map of Athens International Airport in front, of my, in front of my eyes. He said, you enter from here, you go from here, you scan your boarding. Before you board, there are two girls. One is black, one is blonde. You go to the blonde. If you go to the black, we're gone. We lose it all. I went, um, I changed my clothes, I shaved, and I walked to the airport. I done what everything he, he told me to do, you know. I, I was waiting um, inside the waiting lounge. My ticket was to Marseille in France. I was French tourist going back to, to Paris, you know, I mean, to France, to Marseille. Um, I was suddenly, um, one of the police officers, you know, the, the, the control came from behind and told me, uh, can I have your passport? And for me, I was dead inside. For the first time in my entire life, inside a European airport with a fake passport, with fake everything. I gave it to him. Um, he looked at me and said, Mr. Kadarov Mohamedov, um, where are you going? I said, well, I had to just come up with a story. I said, I've got my gala friend in Marseille. And we are celebrating our anniversary. Is there any problem, sir? He looked, no. Good luck. Enjoy. I didn't believe it. I rushed to the airport, you know, to the aeroplane. And the first thing I did, I, 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 I smashed my passport. I threw it into the toilet. Because the smuggler told me, if you land in France and the police catch it with you, they will, they will confiscate it. You will be fingerprinted. They will deport you back to Greece. You'll lose the money. You're fingerprinted. Uh, the money is gone. Game is over. So to my surprise, I landed, after like two hours and a half, I landed in, in Marseille, you know. No police, nothing at all, because it was inside the Schengen area. I said, why on earth I destroy my passport? Could use it again to fly to the UK. It was too late. I, I went to Paris. From Paris, I moved to um, Calais. Spent about two weeks in Calais. They were the worst days of my entire journey. An awful place in the heart of the, the European continent, in the heart of Europe, a place called Calais. There's no... There's no friends, the hundreds and thousands of there's just people, you know, a lot of children, uh, gangs. It's, it's an awful place. Uh, two weeks every day, jumping, you know, jumping off the fences and cars, the smugglers put me in the back of, of flurries with food and vegetable and meat and freezing. The last night in Cali, an Egyptian smuggler, he put me and other seven people in a tanker full of bread flour. I said, two hours, you'll have your dinner in London. I was literally like singing in a flower, you know. Literally, and, and, and the, 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 the smuggler walked away. When he walked away, he looked the hole that which we slipped through, you know. It was total darkness. Um, I turned on my, my, my mobile, there's no signal. All I could breathe was this flower, you know. Um, no air, no, no light, nothing at all. At like five hours, it, it didn't move. At like six, nine hours, seven, eight hours, it started moving. At like 11 hours, we all started suffocating. The child, you know, he started crying. And he lost conscious, and he fell into this water, I mean, the, to, inside the tanker, you know. And we had to lift him up. After like 11 hours, we all started crying like children. We started knocking and knocking and knocking. The driver stopped. I was supposed to be heading to the UK. And to our surprise, we're near the Italian border. It was the wrong car. It was the wrong driver. We, we didn't have, I mean, we, I was shook, but I didn't have an option. I, put, I had to put my faith in him because the system failed us. You know, I, I went back to Cali, then, then moved to Germany. From there, uh, I, in a, another back of a car of a lorry, I managed to get it to the UK. I made it safely to the UK. I landed in Hull after like three months. I got my refugee status. And immediately after that, the UK government told me, you can bring your family. And that's why I came to this country. The family reunion, my gamble, was this was the reason why I came to this country. Immediately, I applied for family reunion, and I managed to get my family safely, you know, to get them from Aleppo to the UK within 500 pounds only. I paid $15,000 to the smugglers, but, but, but I didn't have an option but to do this. I managed to get here. My family is now living here. Recently, I've been given a scholarship. Today, I'm studying at the University of London. Um, I'm doing a, a course in violence, conflict, and, and, and development. Hopefully, one day soon, the conflict would come to an end so I can go back to my family, to my friends, and help rebuild my country. Just to conclude and just to finish off, it's heartbreaking when we see this humanitarian crisis turned into a political crisis. You know, At the end of the day, we are not different. We are the same. We are the same. We've got the same heart. We've got the same blood. You know, we all share the same dreams. We share the same um, hopes. And again, and, um, for these people, you know, for, for, for the Syrian in particular, and beyond Syria, and all these people are fleeing, um, it's not through the, the walls and the fences. This is not gonna go, it's not gonna, gonna solve the problem. And again, for, for, as a Syrian, I just have one message to you, and I really encourage you just to think about it. A lot of these people, especially Syrians, they had homes. Today they're homeless. You know, they had jobs. Today they're jobless. The only thing they have today is hope. 
please, please do, my, do not make them hopeless. Thank you very much.